The message the Lord gave me was a message entitled, A Famine in the Land. A Famine in the Land, out of the book of Amos. I want you to turn to the book of Amos. A Famine in the Land, Amos chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 11 through 13. A Famine in the Land, and you'll see how much it parallels the church and America, indeed the whole world today, what has happened. The book of Amos, chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, a famine in the land. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's word. And beloved, Amos was not a professional prophet. He was a herdsman, and God reached down, and it's amazing how God does it. You know, he, he, when, when, God called, when Jesus called the apostles, his, his, uh, the apostle Paul learned in the best schools, the rabbinical schools at the feet of Gamaliel, and God sends him to the Gentiles, and his Peter, a fisherman, and God sends him to the Jews that confront the scribes, the Pharisees, those who have gone to the theological schools. But they said they could not refute the wisdom of Peter because God spoke to him and through him. Amen? So his Amos, beloved, he's not a, uh, never expected this, but the word of the Lord came unto Amos, just like it may come unto you someday, like it did unto me. And God says, now go. And remember, God has never called us to be successful. God has called us to be faithful. When you looked at Christ's ministry, it looked like he was a failure. At the cross, beloved, what did he have? A few women stood far away from him. But it wasn't a failure, of course. Uh, we know it was all according to the determinate counsel of God. It was in humanity. My message is a famine in the land. Amos chapter 8. Begin with verse 11. This is the Lord speaking. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, the Dead Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, and from the north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. They want to hear it, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. A famine in the land. Father in heaven, we exalt you, we magnify you, and we praise you, O God. And Lord, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, you'd open up the eyes of our understanding today. Lord, let us put aside all thoughts and see how serious this is, because what's in front of us is eternity. Lord, anoint this preacher with feet of clay. Give me the physical strength I need to preach this last message, I pray in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, from the beginning, Israel expressed contempt for God's word. They regularly defied and they disobeyed it. Moreover, they watered it down and they started commingling it with heathenistic worship and idols. And when they did this, this absolutely infuriated God. That was called a syncretic religion. It was like trying to mix oil and water. They don't mix. And God couldn't believe it, really, because God had done so many miracles among them. And that's why people say about miracles, you know, if I only saw a miracle, I believe. They did in Jesus' day. They did in Israel's day. Imagine seeing the Red Sea split, ten plagues come upon uh, uh, the the nation of uh, uh, Egypt, destroying Pharaoh's army, and yet they still went unbelief. So, beloved, because of their idolatrous worship, God, in his great mercies, did something. He sent to them prophets. Now, a priest speaks to God on behalf of the people, and a prophet speaks to the people on behalf of God. That's the difference. The word priest means bridge builder. The word prophet is a proclaimer. See, God says, thus saith the Lord, now go tell them. Being a prophet was not an easy job. As a prophet, a man had to go and confront the king. Thus saith the Lord, O king. And that king could have his head. And that's why we know Elijah, when he ran uh, from Ahab and Jezebel, beloved, because they were seeking to kill his life. You know, a lot of people today are saying they want to be prophets. It's not a good job. It is not telling everybody what they want to hear, that God's going to bless you. This is your season. Everything's wonderful. Being a prophet in Scripture was a very serious and a very... uh, Um, deadly type of a business, okay? But these people were in idolatry, so what did God do? He sent them his prophets to proclaim to them his word so they'd repent so they wouldn't have to face his judgments. God did not want to judge them. But 
They were not welcomed or listened to. Instead, God's very own people, they started persecuting and harassing, and they killed the prophets because they did not want to hear what they had to say, beloved. In other words, what I'm saying is these prophets were God's mouthpiece, and they said, we don't care what God has to say. We have our own lives to live, like people say today, and we're going to do what we're going to do. Now, that's okay. You can say that. Nobody answers to me. I'm not going to be your judge, but you can't say that to God. Amen. You know it's God's way, no way, or the highway. So and it's not the, you're the, the goosebumps you may have or the feelings you may have or I may have, that means nothing before God. It's what he's given uh, within his word. Would you say amen out there? And likewise, beloved, in the New Testament, Stephen, the very first martyr, was also arrested. He was slain by his own Jewish compatriots or countrymen for preaching the truth about Jesus. In Acts chapter 7, verse 52, um, Stephen said, which of the... The Greeks literally says, name one of the prophets you have not persecuted. Name one, only one of the prophets. Now, can you imagine, beloved, they didn't even name one prophet that was sent to them, uh, that, that God had sent, that they had not persecuted or killed or nailed to trees or cut them in half because they did not want to hear what the Word of God uh, had to say. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, beloved, Jesus said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, for great is your reward in heaven. Listen to me now. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. In other words, if you're being persecuted as a Christian because you're living for Christ and you're vocal for Christ, God says you're in good company. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, Israel had a consistent history of not welcoming or listening to the prophets. So God, uh, that God has sent them to preach and proclaim his word, will, and ways to them to get them to repent and return to him. He did not, God did not want to judge his own people. God says, the scripture says, God's judgment is a strange work. God does not want to do. God is good, but God is just. So instead, beloved, they became so stiff-necked. These people of God became so rebellious and hard-hearted that in 922 B.C., God himself divided the kingdom of Israel into what we know as the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And beloved, here in these texts right here, God had ironically sent the prophet Amos, a herdsman from Tekoa in the southern kingdom of Judah, to now prophesy and preach the northern kingdom under the reign of King Jeroboam II between the years of 765 and 755 B.C. God says he reached right down. Imagine, you know why? He couldn't find too many people in the northern kingdom. They're all gone into apostasy. So God looked down into the southern kingdom, and he finds a herdsman. And his name was Amos. And God says, you are going to be my prophet, and you're going to go way up north. Just that was taking your life in your hands, by the way. Let alone telling the people, and especially Jeroboam II, what they didn't want to hear. And so when Amos preached to the northern kingdom of Israel, beloved, Listen to me, it was at its peak, at its height of its economic and military and political success, just like America is today. It was indefeatable. Remember David and Solomon, beloved, and, and even the kingdom divided into real Israel was a power in this world to be reckoned with. And so here's the northern kingdom at the height of its political career, military career, economic career, like America is today, enjoying such great success. And they were a very powerful and prosperous nation that flourished with wealth and victory over their enemies. But they were also backslidden. And they were immoral and idolatrous, idolatrous nation in God's sight. And so because they wouldn't listen to his prophets who proclaimed the word of God, they were ripe for his divine judgment, which ultimately came. In 722 B.C., when they kept turning away the prophets, God said, that's it. God sent them into the northern kingdom, into Bab uh, Syrian captivity. And that northern kingdom, those ten tribes were essentially assimilated into the heathen nations and they went out of existence. And then their sister nation, the southern kingdom, God says you're even a worse war. That's what God called them. That, that, in, that, I'm not trying to be vulgar with you, but God called them that because they were spiritual idolaters. They were fornicators, spiritual fornicators. God said you're even worse than the northern kingdom and he sent them into Babylonian captivity in 586 base B.C. So in other words, beloved, these people kept saying, listen, when you read Jeremiah, they kept saying, the temple of God, the temple of God, the temple of God. In other words, God's temple's right smack dab in the midst of Jerusalem. He will never let it be overrun by the heathen, but he did. 
Listen, beloved, God doesn't live in temples. The heaven and heavens can't fill God. He just wanted to dwell a little bit in their midst while they were following him. Amen? And so, beloved, they went into Babylonian captivity, the southern kingdom. Why? Because they grew tired of listening to the truth of God's messengers and God's messages. They grew tired of hearing God's true prophets always preaching out against their sin and unrighteousness and the need for them to live holy, righteous, and godly before God because their God was a holy God. And God said, do not defile yourself. When we get saved, God gives us a robe of righteousness, a white robe of righteousness. It kind of covers us like this here. And God says, don't defile it. And a lot of Christians today don't listen to that. They defile their robe, think nothing of it. You know why? Because they're believing a lie. And I'll talk about that in a second, a little bit, beloved. And they also grew tired, beloved, of all the gloom and doom that was to come upon them that was proclaimed by God's men because of their heresies and because of their apostasies. In Proverbs 29.1, uh, excuse me, it says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. God says, when I deal with you, if you keep hardening and hardening and hardening and not listening and won't do anything, God says, when I do deal with you, it will be without any remedy. Now, that's serious to me. I don't know about to you, beloved, but it is to me because I've seen it as a minister uh, over the years many, many times. Now, God's own people save a godly remnant. There was a, little, there was a few of them. But God's own people now love to hear the smooth, ear-tickling, and uplifting messages given by the false prophets who always made them feel good. They preached and they didn't convict them of sin, beloved, so they said, we want to listen to them. Now, we know, beloved, that the prophet Amos was a contemporary, excuse me, a Hosea and Micah and Isaiah. and John. These were all contemporaries with with uh, um, the prophet Amos. They pro preached in the northern kingdom and they preached in the southern kingdom. In fact, Jonah was sent to preach to the Assyrians. Remember, he said, no way. And that's when he got swallowed by that big fish. But the point I'm getting at, beloved, is this, is that the prophet Hosea, also preaching to the northern kingdom, the younger contemporary of Amos, describes Israel's moral and spiritual poverty and perversity before God and their soon coming judgment. Listen to what he said in Hosea 4.1. He said this, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, northern kingdom, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Now the Hebrew word controversy there is the word reeve, and it means that God has a fierce dispute, a fierce disagreement, a fierce debate with the inhabitants of the land. In other words, God says, you angered me. You've got me righteously infuriated right now. You see, beloved, in their physical and material opulence, in this uh, comfort and contentment that they had in their life, in their moral and spiritual complacency and lethargy, they'd forsaken God and forgotten His Word and the covenant that they had made with God. When you get baptized, you're making a covenant with God. Amen? It's like a wedding covenant when you get married. Wrong hand. This hand. Okay. I wore my wedding ring one when I can't stand stuff on my fingers, plus the... I was working as a lineman at the phone company then. I didn't want to rip my finger off. But, but the, the point I'm getting at, beloved, here's these people that said, yes, we'll obey you, God. Yes, we'll obey you, God. Yes, we'll obey you, God. So God put blessing after blessing upon them. And guess what they started doing now? Saying, you know what? Maybe this isn't from God. Maybe it's from my own hard work. Maybe I've just been lucky in life. Like a lot of people think, right? I have the Midas touch. Everything turning to gold before me. So in their self-deception and their smugness, they had a very dangerous, false sense of security and a false sense of prosperity, just like many in the church in America do today, beloved. They thought, and we think, that we can be as sinful as the devil and still go to heaven. They thought, and we think, that we can be moral and spiritual reprobates and still go to heaven. They thought, and we think, beloved, we can be unfaithful to God and His Word and His will and His ways and still escape God's punitive judgment. But that's not true. Beloved, let me give you an example just from recently, just you watching your TV. Just look at all the earthquakes. Just look at all the floods. Look at all the heat waves, beloved, that have been broadcast on the news this week. You can't read the Old Testament without saying, how does God judge nations? Earthquakes. Floods, droughts, famines, crime, war, 
That's how God judges. Again and again, beloved, can you imagine? And people are not listening because they do not know the word of the Lord. Would you say amen out there? Surely, beloved, God is judging the church in America. But most are ignorant of what the Bible says about how God pours out his divine judgments and retributions on both nations and people. And I told you, God can only judge nations in this life. God can judge people in this life and in the next life. But nations only in this life. God said this in Hosea 4, 6 to these people again. He says, my people, whose people? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Thus, because thou hast rejected my knowledge, God says, I will reject thee. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge? What a shame, beloved. It's the preacher's job to teach you knowledge. Would you say amen out there? So God now hid his face from them and no longer sent them as true preachers to proclaim to them the true word of the Lord. And folks, this prophecy was fulfilled to the letter during the 400 years of the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There was 400 years that heaven was shut up tight, tighter than a drum. Heaven was silent. Not one word of God came down. Not one preacher came forward. No prophets were sent. Until John the Baptist finally came on the scene. And the Bible says in the New Testament, and the word of the Lord came unto John's out in the wilderness somewhere. The Bible says the word of the Lord came unto John, and John started preaching. I don't know who to. He's out in the wilderness. He's standing in the water, the squirrels, the lions, the tigers. And then people started hearing about there's some prophet out there. He's either nuts or he's sent from God. But imagine 400 years, beloved. God said, I won't say a word to you anymore. Yeah, I've had it right to I, they, I've had it right to hear with you. So, beloved, consequently, what happened? They didn't hear the word of the Lord. They had no preachers. They had no prophets. What happened to them? The Bible says many perished because of their lack of knowledge about God's word. Ladies and gentlemen, the principle in these texts applies both to America and Christians today, to churches today, beloved. History will again be repeated in the last days before the Lord returns at the second advent. That's why God's people didn't even recognize him at the what? First advent. Only a little remnant recognized him. Imagine that. And they had the preachers, the synagogues. The... But most people did not know the word of the Lord. Oh, they heard a lot of preaching, but it wasn't the right kind of preaching. It was not the true word of the Lord. Would you say amen out there? The love of the New Testament everywhere teaches that in the end of this age, before Christ returns... There is going to be the great apostasy from both the faith and the word of God in the church and also in society. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, he said, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, the apostasia, and the man of sin, the Antichrist, be revealed, the son of perdition. Before Antichrist shows up. Before Christ shows up, God says many churches are going to be, the false churches will be packed to the brim. God's real churches won't be. Because there'll be a great apostasy in the land. Because people want to live, they want to go to heaven, they want to do what they want to do too. So they want heaven on earth and heaven, heaven. that's the Joel Osteen crowd. When he says it's your best life now, if it's your best life now as a Christian beloved, you're not saved. My best life is when I go to heaven. My best life is when I stand before the Lord. My best life when I get eternal life. How about you? When I live in my heavenly mansion, that's my best life, not my best life now. And through faith, I have to believe that that's true, because if I don't, I'll start leaving, living like everyone else and just looking for a ticket out of hell, which a lot of people are trying to do today. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying people both in and out of the church will lose all fear of the Lord. And as a result, they will but depart from the true moral and spiritual principles and preachings of the Word of God, and they won't know where to go uh, to find it when they finally wake up. And people have said that to me before. Uh, I remember a, a, a young man years ago, he says, when I, when I heard you preach, preacher, he says, it's like I came out of a dark cave into the bright light. It, it, not because it was me, because it was the Word of the Lord. See, he heard the Word of the Lord, the true Word of the Lord, and he came out of his dark and into the bright light. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, they won't know where to go to find it. Why? Because God himself, Amos tells us, hid it from them 
unless they would repent of their sin and stop following the voices of all of the false prophets and stop following the voice of their own conscience, which was telling them exactly what they wanted to hear and not what they needed to hear. Now, all of you folks that have been in the military know there's things that you need to know if you want to survive in combat, right? I mean, that's why they have boot camp. That's why they have it special forces training. That's why they have all. You need, there's some things you vitally need to know so your training, your muscle memory, you just react and you do it, beloved, so you can survive. But what's happening is a lot of Christians today are not getting the word of the Lord, so they don't know how to survive. They just say, well, I believe in Jesus, and they think that word believe pisteo, <coughs> simply means I made a mental head ascent uh, to the Lord, but that's just not true. Amen? So, beloved, they heard what they wanted to hear, but they didn't hear what they needed to hear. So there'll be a famine in the land in the last days of God's true word. And there'll be a famine in the land in the last days of God's true preachers. And there'll be a famine in the land of God's true churches that aren't contemporary churches. The face of Christianity today is the charismatic and Pentecostal movement with all of their shenanigans. That's the face of Christianity today. Not true sin, hate, and devil stomping, pump and pound, the window rattle and shingle pull and blood bought, born again, Sabbath keeping Judeo Christian churches like it used to be. But now it's all, this is your season to prosper. All these gifts, these signs, these wonders. People are always raising their hand. I, no, I got no problem raising a holy hand. As long as you come down, you're obeying God. You can jump up and down. As long as you come down, you're paying your tithe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're to lift up a holy hand, the Bible says. A holy hand under the Lord. Now this is to see about this coming famine in the land. Number one, the divine sender of this famine. The divine sender of this famine. Look what it says in verse number 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a, uh, a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, beloved, notice that this was not an empty or an idle threat, but this was a divine promise from Almighty God Himself. He says, I will send a ra'av, a famine, that is a divine dearth, a divine lack, a divine shortage, but it will not be of food or of water or of bread caused by some human incompetency in their agricultural or farming skills or abilities. No, sir, no, ma'am. This was supposed to be no ordinary but an extraordinary type of famine that would not only affect their bodies, beloved, but most especially it was going to affect their souls. This famine would affect his impenitent and carnal and unfaithful people, not only physically, but both spiritually and ultimately eternally, beloved, lest they turn back to him and start obeying his word. And I want you to notice that this famine that was sent by God was one of Shema. That, in Deuteronomy 6.4, every pious Jew, when he leaves his house, he has a masuza hanging up, and he kisses it with his right hand touches it, and wrapped up there is the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Elohim, Yehovah Hakad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He kisses it, and when he comes home, does the same thing. So the word Shema means to listen. It means to listen attentively. It means to listen closely. It means to pay great attention to. Hear, O Israel. So he says that this was going to be one of hearing. It would be a shortage of being able to find and listen to and hear true preachers of the Word of God, true teachers of the Word of God, beloved. They would teach them all about God's Word, will, and ways. It was going to be a famine in the land, a very shortage in the land of men that would be able to do that. You know, every kind of life requires food and nutrients to sustain it. Amen? You see, man eats natural foods to nourish and sustain his physical life. And the way some of you, he looks like you're trying to live forever. (laughs) But man's spiritual nature in life is no different. The Bible says it needs the spiritual meat. It needs the spiritual food of the Word of God to nourish and sustain the spiritual life that God has given you. In other words, beloved, you have to stay plugged in like uh, Billy and I were Messing around with you had electrical problems yesterday. And I figured, oh, good, I've said, everything else has gone wrong this week. Now I'm going to get zapped today. But we finally got it squared away. But you've got to stay plugged in before uh, you're going to get all this uh, uh, moral and spiritual and eternal nourishment that you're going to need for God. Are you plugged in? I hope so. I hope you can say, I'm plugged into God. 
I know I'm plugged into God. So what I'm saying to you, beloved, is simply this. <coughs> Excuse me. Is that Jesus said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus said, my meat, the food that I eat is to do and to preach the Father's will who sent me. Jesus said his flesh was were, uh, his flesh or word, I should say, was meat indeed, and his blood was drink indeed. And then Jesus went on to say that those who did not eat his flesh or drink his uh, blood have no life in them. Now, beloved, that is not actually turning transubstantiation, the, the, the communion elements into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Listen to me. God made man in his image. Man can't make God in his image. He doesn't have that power uh, like a lot of churches are trying to teach. That's just heresy right from the get-go. And by the way, that didn't come into the church until 1200 BC, uh, uh, AD. For 1200 years the church didn't believe that. But what I'm trying to say, beloved, is this here. Is that if you don't eat his flesh and drink his blood, that is his word, constantly feasting on the word of God, then God says you're going to die of spiritual salvation and you will die unforgiven. And beloved, these words, eat and drink, are present tense verbs that show constant and continuous uh, action. That is not a one-time indulgence of God's word, not a two-time indulgence of God's word, or a few time, not a sporadic, I'll come, I'll go, I'll read, I won't, I'll do, I won't. You see, beloved, I want to tell you something, you're going to starve. You're going to die. You hear me now? Listen to me. This is not for me. Believe me what I'm telling you. I am not trying to exalt preachers. I'm not trying to exalt anything except the Word of God and you being saved. When I say you, all you folks watching my television, if you want to get me, come here next week. <laughs> you see, beloved, what I'm saying is this, is meaning that if we ever expect to forever have the moral and spiritual nourishment of God's moral and spiritual and eternal life in us. And so we don't, uh, to nourish and sustain us, beloved, on our journey to heaven, then daily, weekly, we need to feed and feast off of the true milk and meat of the Word of God so we can have moral and spiritual and eternal life in us, beloved, and our spiritual life does not start starving and withering and ultimately atrophying, and then we die. Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Remember, beloved, that won't get you to heaven. He that saith they love me and keepeth not my commandments is a what? A liar, and the truth is not in him. That's the acid test. That's the litmus test. I didn't say it. So you can see that Israel saying, oh, yeah, we believe in Jehovah God, but we believe in Baal, too. They say, that's the syncretic. Yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I believe in doing my own thing, too. I believe I'm free to do whatever I want, so uh, yeah, none of us are that free. But, you know, the more discipline you have, the freer you are. Nothing can control you. And that's what Jesus knew. Jesus said, which of you convicted me of sin? None of you have the power to tempt me. I get control of my faculties. I, well, where'd you get it, Jesus? I studied and obeyed the word of God. Amen? He says, I have more knowledge than all of my teachers. That was the prophecy in the book of Psalms. I have more knowledge than all of my prophecy, uh, uh, all of my peers. So, beloved, what I'm saying is this here, is a lot of people today are dying of spiritual starvation and famine. And the reason they are is because they have been playing games with God and God has sent the famine himself, a punitive judgment into their life because of their sin and their apostasy and their unfaithfulness. You hear me now, man desperately needs to hear and know and communicate with his creator, beloved. He needs to hear the word of God. Now, I didn't set the rules. God set the rules. Therefore, it is essential for the moral and spiritual life and, uh, of our soul to constantly and continuously hear the Word of God. And, beloved, we need to hear it rightly preached and rightly divided. Amen? Somebody, from the day I started preaching, I said, check me out. Go to the Bible. Check me out. If I'm wrong, correct me. And I'll say, beloved, if you can find something I can't, you've saved me for work. I'll study it out, pray on it, and if it's true, I'll praise you. I'll, I'll bow at your feet. You'll be my teacher. Okay? But the fact of the matter is, now we find out the truth. 
Are they preaching truly from the Word of God? Not a, a, a word here or a phrase there and cut it off here and not give you the whole thing there. See, the, the Word of God must be rightly divided. That word, uh, when the Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That word rightly dividing, orthodonte, is the Greek word. And we get our word orthodontist from it, straightening out your teeth. It needs to be straightened out. And that's what God's preachers did. And that's what God's prophets did. They straightened it out. You have heard it said of old, that you, thou shalt not come to adultery. But I say unto you, Jesus said. In other words, they taught you wrong. They taught you to obey it outwardly. I'm telling you, you can't obey it outwardly until you obey it inwardly. That's what the true word of the Lord said. That was the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave. Amen. He gave them this true spiritual meaning of the law of God. The law of the law is perfect, the Bible says, converting the soul in Psalm 19 and verse 7. So, beloved, the greatest necessity, the most urgent and imperative need of all humanity is to hear the word of God so they can place their faith in God and they can let him save them initially, finally, and fully. Amen? In other words, you need to go along for the ride. Get in the boat, Joel. Okay, yes, Lord, I'm here. Okay, hold on. There's going to be some bumpy waves. We all get some bumps in our life. Amen? Uh, somebody came up to me today and said, Pastor, how's that right foot of yours? It seemed like Satan attacked my right foot this week. Must have been kicking too many people in the behind to get them going. You know what? I said, it's a step along the way. It'll be behind me. And if not, and I die, it's gained. Right? Listen to me now. Dying's easy. Living's hard. Am I right? Dying's easy. I have no fear of dying. It's the way I die. <laughs> Every last drop of life, I tell you, ah, and finally give it up. <laughs> so, listen to me. God sends his preachers to them. And that's why Paul says in Romans 10, 17, So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing how? By the word of God. And that's why Paul said in Romans 10, 14, How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they, uh, uh, shall they be sent unless God sends that preacher? See, God has to do it. I remember when I started this church, everybody said to me, you'll never make it. You're not, not in New England, you won't. You need to go someplace else. You need to be an evangelist. You need to blah, 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 blah. God, I said, this is where God wants me. And you know what? I'd rather be on the front lines. How about you? I'd rather be at the tip of the spear. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life, Paul said. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.21, now listen to me now. He says, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So what are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying that God's divine method, that God's divine manner, God's divine means of saving and sanctifying people is by Him sending His duly ordained preachers to preach and proclaim the infallible Word of God. Why? So folks can hear it. Why? So folks can believe it. Why? So folks can accept it and obey it and follow it and get saved and get sanctified and get to heaven and escape the burning, boiling, bubbling flames of hell. That's why God sends preachers. You know, I've taught you before, when the Bible says Jesus went and when he preached, everybody has a picture of Jesus walking like this. The word preach for Jesus use, it's the Greek word caruso. It means to herald. You've heard it said of old. And Jesus, Jesus was a man's man when the... Even the Greek word for carpenter means he was more of a mason than he was a carpenter. So he was a rugged monkey. Uh, excuse me, Lord. He was a rugged guy, okay? <laughs> and so he's not just saying, you heard it said of old that if you... Uh-uh-uh. When Jesus preached, he thundered the word of God. And the Bible says he preached with authority. People knew that only God himself could have ordained this man. You see, beloved, so... This is God's biblical method of saving people. This is God's divine design. How are you going to save people? Through my preachers. How are they going to do it? Preaching the Word of God. How are you going to save my people? Through my preachers. How are they going to do it? By preaching the Word of God. You hear me now. God sends His chosen, His gifted. 
God sends his anointed. God sends his duly trained and ordained preachers to both proclaim and rightly explain the moral and spiritual truths of the word, will, and ways of God. Why? So folks can hear it. Why? So folks can understand it. Why? So folks can obey it, beloved, and they can be saved. I'm saying the preacher's job is to clearly and correctly explain and clarify the word, will, and ways of God to enlighten men's minds and illuminate their souls so they can know and understand both the God of the word and the word of God because you can't separate the two. People that are saying, I'm sitting there getting this extra revelation, beloved, they don't know God one whit. The Bible is God's revelation to man. God says, you want to know me? Read my book. You want to know me? Go to a nice preacher, somebody that knows what he's talking about, and let him explain it to you. So you can be saved and sanctified. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, I believe me, I'm not saying that for my benefit. I might be a heretic. You check me out. I'm saying that for your benefit. Because you know me. I check everything. I'm, a, I'm not the kind of guy somebody tells me. I'm from Missouri. You know, you, you, yes, that's true. prove it to me. And, and, and that's one of, my, <laughs> one of my downfalls, too, but all that to say. I've only got two downfalls. Say. That's only one of them. Oh, hear me now, beloved. Listen to me now. You tell me if this is true or not. There is no true knowledge of Scripture. There is no true knowledge of God or the Lord Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. There's no true, true knowledge about what sin is and pardon and the gospel and salvation and sanctification. There's no true knowledge about uh, eternal life in heaven or God's mercy and grace or Satan in hell or angels and demons. No true knowledge of the kingdom of God and kingdom of darkness, beloved, and so much more unless his preachers come out and preach the true word of God and they do it rightly and you can check it out and find out. Have you learned a lot since you've been a Christian because you've studied, you've come to Sabbath schools, some of you've come to seminary, you've come to church, and you've heard every doctrine from propitiation, prophecy, to everything else, and you checked it out. Amen? And then someone tried to get a hold of you and say, you know what, we keep Sunday because of this. And you said to them, prove it. And they couldn't do it. Why? Because they didn't want to get to the tip of the spear. They wanted something that was comfortable because you're a Sabbath keeper, you have to adjust your life, see, to God's schedule. That's the only commandment that requires that you do it. Amen. I had a woman say to me, Pastor Joel, I know it's true. I know it's true. But I do my banking on Sabbath. I said, what good is it for you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Your banker isn't going to stand before you on the day of judgment. And she did whatever she wanted to do. But my job is just to preach it. Amen. So, beloved, God sends his preachers to give you the true meaning of the word of God so you can go to heaven. God's preachers, beloved, help you hear and understand that true meaning. God's preachers are his gift to the church. But most people take that gift for granted just like Israel did. Here's another one. What's this babbler saying? Isn't that what they said about the prophets? Isn't that what they said with Paul when Paul went to Mars Hill in Athens? What's that babbler got to say now? Imagine, beloved, the words of eternal life. The very words of the creator of the universe are being proclaimed and they're calling him a babbler. He's nothing to look at. He's not articulate. Why should we listen to him? He's not these great oratorical schools where he can pronunciate and articulate and communicate, the, you know, like the orators of Greece did. Paul said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power, that your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's what Paul said. You know what, brother? I'd rather have someone that says ain't, and he says instead of doesn't, and it's anointed by God. I get the drift. I don't care if his English is perfect. When Dwight L. Moody, he was a shoe salesman, he never finished school. When God came upon him, he was walking downtown Chicago, and uh, he, was a, he had a Sunday school, beloved. He was walking downtown Chicago, and these two, b b let me back up a little bit. He was in church one day, and these two women came up, and they said, they said uh, Mr. Moody, you need an anointing by God. And he says, I am anointed. He says, you need, they kept saying, he said, you need an anointing by God. So what did White old Moody know? So he kept praying. I need an anointing by God. I need an anointing. He started praying, Lord, anoint me, anoint me. He's walking downtown uh, in Chicago, yes. And all of a sudden, boom, God came upon him. And he staggered. 
and he knocked on the door of a friend. He says, let me in. God's deal with me. He said, for four hours, God's grace and love came upon him. And right when he said, Lord, stay thy hand. Stay thy hand, lest I die. Dwight Moody said he had eight sermons. For years, he preached eight sermons. No one came to the altar. But now, when he preached, everyone came. And we know he became the great, one of the great evangelists of the 19th century. He went to England, beloved. He went to Cambridge in England. And here you have all of these scholars from the Anglican Church. And Dwight L. Moody comes out with his little Bible. And he stood in front of them, no pulpit, and just started preaching to them. He said, ain't, don't, everything that you could. He wasn't articulate. But he looked out into the congregation and everybody was crying. When he went outside, all the theologians, all the ordained ministers, all the scholars went out and they said, we have never heard anyone, and I'm going to use the word, they said, bastardize the English language like you. But we never heard anybody preach like that either. And he started crying. Imagine that, beloved. God's hand was upon that. God had sent Dwight L. Moody. God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Would you say Amen. All of you think that you have to be perfect and have to have all the... No, beloved. It's not your ability. It's your availability. That's what God looks for. Amen? Now, we want to make sure you get trained. We try to train you. But, beloved, what I'm trying to show you is this here, is that God said, there's going to be a famine in the land right now. I'm not going to send you any more, my preachers. Woe unto you. Now you can listen to all of the false preachers and teachers and... Uh, because you don't appreciate the word of God and my preachers that I'm sending unto you. So Amos said this. Amos said that God filled them with the stench of their own rebellion and requests, and he'd weary them no longer with his true word and preachers. Remember Micah? Uh, Micah? The Ahab didn't like what he used to say. He says, I got this one preacher down here, all the false preachers saying, go ahead, go ahead, you're going to win, you're going to win against the Ammonites. Go ahead, go ahead. And his mic locked in chains and a cistern and his knees up to mud underground. And one of the Ethiopians going and saying, listen, Micah, uh, uh, they're, they're calling, uh, uh, what was his name? King begins with a J. No. Oh, see, I got another. You know, you know the story. But he calls and I said, look, it, all of them are telling him that he's going to win the battle. So you just go along with it or they're going to kill you. So they bring Micah and there's his chains. They bring him before him. Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, thank you, Lord. It's tough being 36. King Jehoshaphat. As they said, King Jehoshaphat and, and uh, King Ahab said, are we going to win this battle? And my guy looked at him and said, oh, yeah. <laughs> you're going to win it. Oh, yeah, you're going to take it. And Ahab knew he was mocking him. He says, hey, you tell me the truth. Am I going to win? See, Je Jehoshaphat, he's always making fun of me. And then this false prophet, Hannah, stands up and he says he puts these iron horns on he says you will gore your enemies to death and he goes over to Micah and he slaps him in the face whack and he says now tell me who was it that stopped you Micah said to him I'll tell you what they're going to lose the battle and if you're still around when they come back then I have lied they lost the battle and God struck that man dead you wanted to know the truth? He says, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> okay. You see, beloved, God has sent a famine in the land. Now, beloved, listen carefully to me. The Bible warns in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, that when folks hear and know the truth of the Word of God, but they do not love it or obey it. Now, that's exact words. Now, you can check it out. I want you to hear what God says. God said that he would send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned because they had not a love for the truth. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. They had pleasure in doing their own thing. And so God says, I'll send you strong delusion that you believe a lie. So now, beloved, they believed what they wanted to believe and still thought they were going to go to heaven. So now they rejected and disobeyed God's truth, and they still thought they were going to go to heaven. They indulged the flesh and in this world system, and they lived in unrighteousness, and they thought they were going to go to heaven. And just like today, they get involved 
of the neo-evangelical church and the ecumenical church and the uh, emergent church and they follow their heresies and they still think they're going to go to heaven, but they aren't. Hear the word of the Lord, the Bible says. Amen? Do the word of the Lord. Not just hear. That's what the word hear means. To hear so as to heed the word of the Lord. You see, beloved, God sent them strong delusion that they would believe a lie like he's doing to a lot of people today that don't want to believe his word. You see, beloved, the word of God is what we call objective truth, not subjective. It's not what I want it to be. I don't enter into the text isogetically. This is what I want it to say, so I'm going to take it out. In, in theology, it's called exegesis. It means to lift out. See that exit sign? Ex out in the Greek. Okay? You, you take out of the text what's already in there. Now, subjectively, you may want to apply it, but what is the objective truth that can be lifted out like a famine in the land, like I'm telling you right now? Amen? See, that's what a preacher's supposed to do. He's supposed to objectively lift it out for you and tell you, then apply it to your life. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, God's truth is infallible. It's immutable. It never changes. It's non-negotiable, by the way. It's not arbitrary. It's not, oh, well, you think that, I think that. Let's all get in a circle and have our Bible study. What do you think this means? What do you think that means? <laughs> Why don't you take a revolver, spin it around, and go like this, play Russian roulette. I'll never forget one time when I was, uh, uh, we used to get a paper when I was in Vietnam. It was called Stars and Stripes. It's been around since World War I, <laughs> the military paper. And it showed six soldiers sitting down playing Russian roulette with a revolver. And so there's one bullet in there. You know, you put one bullet in there and you spin it around and the first guy was sitting there like this. And he takes the pistol and he goes, snap! Hands it to the next guy. And that last guy, snap! Next guy, snap! Five guys go by. So he's the sixth guy sitting at the end. Now he knows there's only one bullet in there. So he goes, puts the gun to his head and he goes, snap! <laughs> And goes right through the other five. <laughs> he leans back, snap, <laughs> boom. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. I'm saying there's a famine in the land of God's true word today. There's a famine in the land of God's true preachers and churches today, beloved, that God himself has sent in divine retribution on those who do not love and obey his truth. You see, beloved, most people today are preaching a truncated gospel. Most are preaching a man-centered or a prosperity gospel, what God can do for you, how God can help you, how God can make you rich, how you can enjoy. That sounds great, doesn't it? And yet Jesus was a poor carpenter, right? Most preach, beloved, a signs and wonders gospel or a feel good. And the one that drives me nuts is this pop psychology gospel. You know, the church endured... For, uh, for, uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, 2,000 years without having a psychologist. Now, I'm not going to preach out against psychologists or psychiatrists. I, I've, I've got them in my family, and I think they're all nuts anyways, to be honest with you. But the man's problem is in his head, it's his heart. And the best they can do is give him a bandage until that heart is changed. Amen? Uh, many a psychiatrist that I've spoken to said, you know, if people would just forgive one another, half their problems would be gone. <laughs> Instead of harboring that root of bitterness and everything inside of them. But you know what God's people did? They always took the word of God. And they said, Lord, it's my problem. I've been in sin. I won't forgive so-and-so. I won't do it. See, in God's word, the healing balm of Gilead healed them. They didn't need any psychologists or psychiatrists. And if you're going to one, I'm not telling you nothing to stop. Um, I, I'm just telling you what God's word has to say. All right? And the worst part, beloved, they're preaching a ultra-love and ultra-grace gospel with obedience to, without obedience to God's commandments. And beloved, this is a false gospel. They take half-truth and half-error and they mingle it together and it's counterfeit. If I were to give you a Monopoly $20 bill and I were to give you a, uh, a real $20 bill and uh, you looked at it, you would say, you know what? That's got to be the, it looks like the real thing, but it's not the real thing. And that's what's happening today. It looks like the real thing, but it's not the real thing. Amen? Because you have to test it. You have to try it. 
But what do you do when you go to the doctor? He, he, he recommends tests. They want to see what it is. He, through the process of elimination, they can get down. Okay, this is what it is. It could be one of these three things. You know what you do? You change doctors, you feel great. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm just, I'm just playing with you. But beloved, do you despise or do you love God's true word? Do you despise or do you love God's true preachers? I hope you do. Do you despise or do you love God's true churches? I hope you can say amen, preacher. I do. Well, beloved, my clock just ran out, but I am finishing. I'm on vacation. Number two, the desperate search for the famished. I make it quick, I promise you. Look at verse 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Beloved, some of the folks in Israel finally woke up from their moral and spiritual sleep and slumber. They woke up from their stupor. And now they saw their moral and spiritual poverty and perversity before God and they were sore afraid. Why? Because now they saw that they had a problem. So in a frantic panic, these former ingrates realized that the true word and preachers and churches of God that they had once taken for granted were scarce. They were hard to find. Where do we go to find the true word of the Lord and be saved and be sanctified and be cleaned up and be ple pleasing to God? Where do we go? See, now they're starting to wake up. Praise the Lord, at least they're starting to wake up. Amen? So now they realize that their mortal soul was in danger, beloved, because it seemed like the unbelievable had become a reality as proclaimed by God's true preachers. The true preachers came out and said, listen to me, if you won't hear what I have to say to you, there's coming a time when God will not send any more prophets or preachers to you. Did that happen? Yes, it did. Again and again and again, and especially during those 400 uh, intertestamental uh, uh, period years, beloved. So there was indeed a famine in the land of God's true word and preachers and churches, beloved, and it was as if God had withdrawn himself from them. But notice the word it says here, that they would wander. Nahua is the Hebrew word. It means that now that they finally had a hunger and thirst for the truth, beloved, it eluded them. I, I, I want to know, Pastor, what did you teach there on Revelation? What was that about propitiation, Pastor? I, I want to know, what was that Greek phrase? Where you, they had week after week, beloved, in front of them again and again and again till their ears flopped over. Now they wanted it and they couldn't find it. You see, beloved, they fervently searched and searched. Amos says, all around, all over the land of Israel, they trembled as they looked for it. They went to and fro, hither and thither, and they couldn't find it. And so frantically and aimlessly they scurried about and all Israel like hungry rats looking for food from the Dead Sea in the north to the Mediterranean Sea in the east, as we see in our text, to the remotest parts of Israel. They went all the way in the north and down in the south and east and west, but they couldn't find it, beloved. And this was something now that they desperately searched and craved and longed for, something that God had wanted them to have. Now there was a famine in the land and they couldn't get it. I hope you don't have that kind of a spirit. Jesus told the morally and spiritually indifferent and, uh, indifferent and impenitent Jews in his day. In John 7, 34, he said this, You shall seek me, but you shall not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Imagine, three and one half years, the eternal Son of the living God in the flesh was before them preaching and teaching, and they wanted nothing to do with him. Jesus said to these same people of his day, beloved, in Luke 17, 22, he says, the days will come when you shall desire to see the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not find it. Folks, there's a famine in the land and the churches in America, and it's sent by God. Why? Because of our cavalier attitude towards the Word of God. Carnal, worldly, compromising churches and Christians and false preachers and teachers are everywhere. Few truly hunger and thirst after the word of God, beloved, after uh, uh, good preaching and good churches, beloved, who the whole counsel of God. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Timothy was the first bishop of the church at Ephesus. John, as far as we know, was the last one. He was in his 90s at that time. Paul's writing from a mammothine prison. He's three stories underground, damp, dark, 
rats everywhere, a candle before him, he's chained hand and foot to a Roman soldier, and he's writing his last memoirs because in a few days he's getting ready to have his head lopped off. He says, Timothy, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto uh, fables. But watch thou in all things, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for the time of my departure is at hand, Paul said. In season, out of season, when it's convenient, not convenient. You folks who have attended, I've done many funerals and, and many weddings. I preached at funerals. I preached at weddings. I remember one time, uh, I, when I first started in the ministry, uh, for some reason, uh, uh, there was this older woman who had a lot of weight in the church. I, I don't mean she was a heavy woman, <laughs> okay. She carried a lot of influence in the church, and she was kind of rich. And, I, and I, I was preaching through Romans at that time, and she came up, and uh, her mother had died. And she said, uh, Pastor Joel, I want you to do my funeral. I said, I'm only assistant pastor. She goes, I want you to do it. Now, if I was the pastor, I'd say, go ahead and do it. Go ahead. No pastor likes doing funerals. <laughs> okay. But her husband wasn't saved. So she says, I want you to do it. I says, why? Because I know you preach the gospel. I said, you want to get me hung. She says, no. She says, I, I want you to do it. So, beloved, here he is, and they have open casket. And she's got her big tape recorder. And she looks at me, she goes, Click. <laughs> I said, I want to thank you all for coming today. I said, you see the fellow right here? I said, there's nothing more I can do for him, but there's some things I can do for you. And I just started preaching the gospel to him. In season, out of season. I can't do anything for him. I can do it for the people that are sitting out in the pew. Amen. I preached another funeral one time in, in uh, Wareham. And I, we went from the church. We go to the grave site. People are all around. So I'm doing the committal service. And then the Lord came upon me. And I said, okay, Lord, one more time. So I started preaching. And people all around, well, I'm standing on the dirt. You've got to see this, right? I'm standing on the dirt. And I gave an invitation. Five people came forward, accepted Christ. We took them back to the church, and we baptized them. See, God was dealing with the people. So that's being in season when it's convenient, and it's being what? Out of season when it's not convenient. Why? Because everyone has one heartbeat, one breath away from meeting their eternal maker. Now, that's how serious I see it as a preacher. So, beloved, let me ask you something. Are you thankful for faithful preachers and churches and the evangelists, beloved, who've taught you the truth of the Word of God? I, I, I hope you are. I, and if not, you better fervently pray that you can find one. Because they're pretty rare today, aren't they? And number three, beloved, and I'll close with this. Look at verse 13. And in that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. The disheartened seekers who will faint. The disheartened seekers who will faint. Physical suffering follows moral and spiritual famine and starvation. The word faint here, alaf, means to grow weak and weary and languish the body, soul, and spirit. And beloved, it speaks of a moral and spiritual and physical deterioration in both the faith and also in your flesh. Meaning this that if the physically strong young men and women fail in their pursuit of trying to now find God's true word and God's true churches and God's true preachers because of the famine in the land, then what chance does the elderly have now? What chance do the weak and the infirm have now? What chance do the ignorant have now? What chance does that penitent backslider who God finally shook the fire out of them and they woke up. Where do I go now? I need somebody to teach me the word of God. I need somebody to show me the truth. Oh, where do I go? Where do I go? Where do I go and worship this God? God said that the strong young men and women can't find it. Imagine how hard it's going to be for people like that. And this is what God warns about in these last days. In other words, they'll sink under the burden of trying to find the bread of life and the water of life to feed and quench their moral and their spiritual hunger and thirst for God's word. Jesus said this. He said, walk in the light while you have light, lest darkness come upon you. 
Beloved, abysmal moral and spiritual darkness has fallen upon this world today, hasn't it? You know that's true. Every Christian that's really worth anything knows that's true. And it's fallen upon America, and worse yet, it's fallen upon the church. You see, there's a famine in the land of true Christians. So many saying, I'm a true Christian. They're all hobnobbing with the world, drinking with the world, partying with the world, dancing with the world, going to the world, and going there. but I'm a true Christian. There's a famine in the land of true churches. They're not worried about building how many people are going to be packing in there, but worrying about the souls that God sends in there. and They're going to stand and give an account before God of what they preach someday. And beloved, there's a famine in the land of a preacher who will have the courage. He needs a backbone of steel. He needs some sand in him. And believe me, I'm not saying this for my benefit. I'm saying it for your benefit. Because a lot of people come and go and they move and they, uh, everything like that. But that's what you've got to find. And you know, my counsel has always been, if you ever move, God never takes a person out of a church, moves them to another state, unless there's a church down there equally as good. Because God's not going to separate you can make all the money in the world and go split hell wide open. God would rather have you stay here, be content with what you have, he'll take care of you, and you've got a good church, right? Now, is that a biblical principle? Yes, it is. Don't argue with me. So, beloved, have you found one? If so, thank God for them. If you found one, you better hold on as tight as you can to them. You better listen to them. You better support them, beloved, because... They are a rare breed. It's rare to find a good church today. It's rare to find a good preacher today. You hear me now. There's a famine in the land. That's my charge to you as I go. Read your Bible. Pray. Be faithful to God. Don't say, well, pass us away. The mouse is going to play. Don't do that. You're not answering to me. You're answering to God. I felt like I was in seminary class. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the throne of grace.